Go ahead, take your seat. and Let me just explain a little story to you that I wanted to start off with, if I may. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to share this because I thought it was important for you to understand. We're going to be talking about the resolute life, which is an interesting word. The word resolute life is actually the title of our message. And so, uh, but a lot of times I use the words, and the words are not words that you commonly use. The word resolute is a different word. But let me explain what it means, and then I'll actually put the meaning of it on the overhead in a few moments. When I was a young man, I was like 22, 23 years old, I had a really cool job. I really thought it was a great job. And um, I was a, a vice president, executive vice president of an insurance company in Beverly Hills, California. And uh, I had an office there in Beverly Hills, California, Wilshire Boulevard in the penthouse. I wasn't the penthouse, but my office was in the penthouse. And I did acquisition, real estate acquisition, for this large insurance company. Can I just share what that means? For those who don't know, insurance companies sell you a piece of paper based on fear, and they give you paper for all the thousands of dollars that you give them. They don't sell you really anything tangible. They sell you a promise. So if the promise is never needed, that's all they do is bank the money. They have more money, insurance companies, than you can ever imagine. Banks borrow from insurance companies and have for decades. And so when they have a lot of money, they don't want it sitting around. They need to invest it. And so I was the guy that made the decisions on buying properties and investing in properties for them. I lived in a little town, at those days it was a little town called Thousand Oaks, California, and I drove every day in a Cadillac all the way up to Beverly Hills, coming into the office every single day. In those days, the car to own wasn't a Mercedes or a Ferrari, it wasn't any of those great kind of cars. In those days, the car to own was a Cadillac, that was the ultimate automobile. And something else took place when I was there. I had not just one Cadillac, but I had two of them in the garage. And so I really thought of myself as a big shot. I wasn't saved. I didn't have an idea about God. I went to church like so many people, thinking God didn't really care about me, and I didn't have a personal relationship with God. My relationship was based on who I was. I thought a lot about myself, you know what I'm saying, instead of God. And I thought I was all that and all those kind of things. In those days, what we did, something a little different than you do today. When you bought a pair of shoes in those days, they were very expensive. And you did something unusual. You know what you did? You polished them. You took care of them. You put a tree, you know, a little shoe tree in there to hold their position and their shape. And when they, this is surprising to everybody under 40, when they wore out a little bit, you took them to something called a shoe repair shop, and this little shoe cobbler would fix your shoes and bring them back to you as good as new. And I remember having a pair of shoes that I just liked. It fit really great. And I went one day to the local shopping center and found that little shoe cobbler, this little shoe repair shop guy, just a tiny little shop. And I went in, and as I was going in the door, a door didn't open, and there was a sign on the door, and it said, be back, and it was like a month and a half from now, closed for vacation, and the guy was gone for like a month and a half. And I'm going, wow, a month and a half vacation, that's pretty good. And so I waited about a month and a half, realized I hadn't needed to get these shoes fixed, and I took it back to that little shoe, shoe, uh, shoe cobbler about a month and a half later down the road, and I talked to him, and I said, he was a really nice guy, so a little guy came in, and we talked, I could tell he had a little bit of an accent, and we talked a little bit, I said, hey, you know, and I was just friendly, I wanted to talk to him. I said, you know, you've been gone for a long time. He says, yeah, he says, I was. He says, I take my family every year to some place in the world, in Europe was last year, and he shows me a picture of his family, and there's like 20 people there. 
And I said, you took all like 20 people to, to Europe last year for two months? He says, yeah, we toured all through Europe. Did a, you know, that in those days, today you buy a ticket online, you get on plane, you're there in Europe, you do your thing, you go, you know, to B&B, &B, whatever it is, people go all the time. In those days, it was very, un we're talking 400 years ago. It was very, <laughs> very unusual for somebody you know, to, to be in Europe and spend time there like that. And you only did such a thing if you were very, very wealthy. And I started to look at this guy. You know, here I was dressed in my handmade suits, my shiny shoes, and my Cadillac car out in front. And I'm staring at him when he said that, and I'm just like stopped. And he could see my face. And he says uh, to me, he says, you're trying to figure out whether or not I can afford this, right? And I said, oh, well, I, I didn't, you know, uh, 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 yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I guess. He says, well, let me tell you something, son. He says, have you got a good job? I said, yeah, I've got a pretty good job. It's, you know, I didn't tell him about the job. He says, you make a lot of money? I said, man, I make a lot of money. And he says, well, let me tell you something. Bring your tax returns in. And I'll bring my tax returns in. And I'll bet you the price of these shoes that I make more money than you as a shoe repair person. And I thought to myself, this guy's going to get sunk. I'm getting some new shoes. But you know what? I was a chicken. I didn't bring them anything. I decided not to take that bet because somehow he scared me. And what I did is I realized something and I started to talk to him. I said, you make that kind of money? He says, yeah, I do. I said, how'd you do it? He says, I'm the best at what I do. I don't go looking for anything else. I stayed with what I know to do, and I did it better than anybody else. I did it so well that I could do it faster, cheaper, but yet be better than everybody else. So anybody in this entire city who tried to be my competition over the last 25 years, they went out of business, and I was successful because I was in there and I was determined to get this job done and you couldn't move him from that that's what he was he stayed with it listen you finish the sentence and to him the grass was not greener. greener and most people that are Americans and especially Christians always looking for the grass to be greener never finishing and doing what there's called of God to do and that's the problem he was if you would resolute and that's what I'm saying to you today. He was resolute about who he was. He was resolute about his job. It didn't make sense, but he did it better than anybody else. And he brought in an income that's far surpassed even an executive from Beverly Hills. And I was amazed. That little story stayed with me all my life. It's what it is. All my life, that story has stayed with me. It was so impressed on side of me. And here we are today when people float around, they change jobs, they change marriages, they change cars constantly, they change everything. They're, they're wavering back and forth, wondering what they should do, how they should do it, when in fact they have the path right in front of them. They just need to stay resolute to that path. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Let me explain the word resolute to you. I'll put it up on the overhead. Is that okay? The word resolute is an interesting word. It means, and in the Bible, you'll find the word resolute is a word meaning steadfast. So every time you see it in the Bible, which is over and over, Old Testament as well as New Testament, you see the word steadfast in there. And you'll find that every great man and every great woman of God that was ever used by God, one of the threads that was threaded through their lives that God used is that they were resolute. They were steadfast in what God told them. They stayed with the things of God. They went on with the things of God and they got the job done. They were determined, every single person in the Bible that was ever a great man, great woman of God was determined. And you'll find that they were unwavering. Unwavering means they were never double-minded. In James, the first chapter talks about double-minded men. They just flip all over the place. 
and they they can't decide today, they're not sure about tomorrow, they're ready for change because they're insecure about where they're at, they're insecure because they're insecure about God, they find themselves in a place, they don't know what's going on, they're they're double-minded, the Bible describes them. That means somebody who's wavering all the time. He finishes the sentence in James with the most interesting analogy of a double-minded man. God says, don't let him think he's going to ever get anything. Don't, let me say it again. God says, don't let him think he's ever going to get anything. You're never going to get anything from God being a double-minded man, changing course on a constant basis, looking for the grass to be greener. The grass is greener when God's in your life. Come on, somebody. And it's vitally important that we live a life of resolute, or if you will, will I like the last word, the word is resolved. We are resolved, settled into it. Now, the word resolved is a different kind of a word, and it's kind of funny because I had a bad feeling about the word resolved, but I'm going to use it today because resolute is something that's on the inside of you that comes out of your bones. Resolve is something when your mind is made up. I need to go past being just resolved to the place where it's on the inside. You can beat me to death but I'm not changing. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what James, Peter, John did? Every man, every woman that was ever great, they had an attitude. They were resolved with God. You can beat them to death. And man, they did. They were. They were burned. They were hacked. They were cut into pieces, the Bible says. There was people challenging them on every turn of the road. But man, they stayed in there with things God. They were resolute. It wasn't just a resolve to mentally go there. It was something that was on the inside of their bones, on the inside of them that made them different. It may have pressure and there may be times it may be difficult, but I'm not giving up. I'm not backing off. I know that I know that I know and that's what I'm going to do. My friends, when you do this in your business, like that little cobbler man, I don't know if he ever had God in his life. I, I didn't know enough about God, talk to him about God. And in those days, can I just be honest with you, I didn't give a flip. I'm like some dumb people in here. I was dumb as a sack of rocks. And uh, I didn't know whether or not there was a God. I questioned everything, didn't care about talking about God. I was just a dimwit that didn't know what I was doing. And I want you to know something. Now, what would his life have been like if he had worked the way he worked and then added an extra element in his life that supernatural goes past the natural. I can only go so far as a man. But listen, I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm talking about getting to the place where the life of Christ is on the inside of me. Now, I'm not only a man that's positive, I've got God that backs me. And that's why the Word of God says all things are impossible. All things are possible to him that does what? Believes. Come on, somebody. So here we find in Scripture such an important truth for all of us. And God gave me like, there's like 40 things. I gave me, it was like I'm having a field day, you know. And I, so I'm, I'm going to bring to you 40 things this morning before we leave. What? I have to tell you a funny little story. I have no idea where this came from, but just like this. I was preaching in Africa one time, and I've, I read the Bible a lot of times, and this guy stands up who had this 10,000-member church, and he says these words to his congregation. I've got 87 things what you ought to do uh, to be a good husband. And I went... <laughs> and we sat there from early morning to late at night, and nobody moved. I have four. Come on, you got to give God a great big praise for this. Because he knows where we're at. i got four things that God gave me to tell you about. <laughs> Is anybody happy about four things? Can I get a great big praise for four things? Thank you, Jesus, for four things. <laughs> a resolve or a resolute to go forward is number one. You know, everything in the world wants to stop you from going forward. Listen to what I'm going to say to you. The first day of staying the same is the beginning 
of backsliding. One more time. The first day, the first day of staying the same with God is the beginning of backsliding. You have to go forward in your life. And a lot of times, there's a lot of excuses why we don't. We don't go forward because our job, or we don't go forward because I'm tired, or I don't go forward because I, you know, I've heard those messages before. We don't go forward. There's a lot of things. And then the devil says, you don't have to. And let me talk to you. Some of you used to come on Wednesday night and bring your children on Wednesday night. It was good for them, but you stopped doing that. You stopped going forward. Some of you used to come on Sunday night, made the day a day for Christ, and no, you stopped doing that. And guess what? I'm here to tell you something. The day you stay, stay the same is the day you start your backsliding. And it won't be long before you're gone. You have got to, with God, go forward. Did you know there's more of God than you can ever learn and be involved in or be anointed by in this lifetime? More of it. And here I am. I found myself in a place where I'm old. And I started to about four or five years ago. I'm retired. I used to preach 350 times a year. Now I'm turning it over to some young men. And these young men are phenomenal. Pastor Dan doesn't get any better. If you haven't heard Pastor Dan, you're here visiting, you need to come back. Pastor Dan's one of the top and best preachers I've ever heard in my life. He's amazing. And so, but, I, but you know, here it is. I, I was finding myself doing a lot of things that were wrong. I didn't know what to do, so I ate all the time. I gained a ton of weight. I found myself uh, frustrated with life. I saw myself bickering with life and complaining. Plus, I had had a back surgery that failed on me, and I was in pain on a constant basis. And then I found myself not exercising, not doing anything. But I decided that that's just a bunch of bull. I decided even though my time on earth is limited, I can still go forward in the age that I am. I don't have to stay and wait for death to come and get me. I'm coming after death. Are you hearing me? And guess what? Because I've got a job to do wherever it is that I'm doing it. And God wants me to do So I've lost. Up now, I've only lost 35 pounds. I've got another 20 to go. And I walk over two miles, sometimes two and a half, three miles every single day. But I didn't today because I'm with you guys. But I, I do it every day. Now, I still walk with a funny little limp. I don't care. I call it the John Wayne limp. <laughs> but, you know, the other day I'm watching a John Wayne movie. And he had that little limp too, but his limp was like masculine and good. Mine is like, man, it hurts. And, uh, but I don't care. There's going to day coming. Guess what? I'm going forward. I'm not going to limp anymore. Come on, somebody. But here's the deal. In going forward, if you don't put your faith out there and then put some works behind it, because my Bible says faith without works is what? My Bible says faith without works is what? Dead. So I got to do my part while God does his part. And I've decided to do that. First thing I did was lose some weight. Thank God. I'm now getting in the clothes I never thought. Have anybody ever had fat, fat, fat clothes? I've gone through the fat, fat clothes. I'm now just in the fat clothes. And I've got a whole closet full of skinny clothes. I don't know, they might have holes in them from moths. They've been there for so long, but I'm going to wear them anyway. So if you see me with a hole in my pants, guess what? It's because I'm wearing something skinny someday. <laughs> You've got to go forward. You can't stay the way you are. We, there's no life in where you've been. God's not interested in lifting you up to where you're at and say, man, I'll live on what I was. I'm not living on what I did good before. I'm going forward. There's more good that God wants in the future. Come on, somebody. Listen to what the Bible says. Paul writes to the church at Philippi. And as he does in the third chapter, verse 13, he makes this brilliant statement. Let's just put it up on the overhead. He says, brother, I do not count myself as if I have apprehended. I do not count myself as if I have apprehended. I mean, if anybody should apprehend, it ought to be Paul. This guy is amazing. He writes two-thirds of the New Testament. 
He's an apostle of the apostles. He's uh, starting churches, preaching the gospel. He's the most amazing person. Man, I would say, hey, Paul, sit back and relax. You already arrived, dude. It's so good. You don't have No, he doesn't consider himself as already arrived because he does something. Listen to this. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Listen, if you live on the past instead of the future, you're going to die and dry up, and that's exactly what the devil wants you to do, is live on the past instead of the future. There's a greater future if you'll let God into the future than you ever had in the past. Somebody ought to say amen. It's just the way it is. It's such a powerful statement. He says, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Verse 14 comes along and makes this statement. I press towards the goal of the prize. Thank God there's a prize for every one of us. Some of it's just his promises coming to pass for you guys. For me, in a few years, hey, I'm out of here. Sweetest breath I'll ever take. So last breath I take on this earth. I want you to know something. It wasn't the first one I'll take on this earth. It's the last one I'll take. I'm looking forward to it. But in the meantime, I'm going to kick the devil's butt. Come on, somebody. You say, preacher, I've never heard anybody say that from the pulpit. It's because you haven't been in a real church. You're playing games. You have a bunch of sissies in the pulpit. Let's say it like it is, man. This is the way this church is, and I love this church because it does that. It's not going to pull any punches on you and tell you like it is. You know? Come on, I, I, I'm going to stop right there because if you get me going, I will say things I will regret later on. Man, that's so cool. I like what Daniel, Daniel has three little friends called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And King Nebuchadnezzar, all reigning power on the earth, he makes a statement. He says, I'm going to resurrect a golden image, and when the music starts to play, I want everybody to bow down to my God. Well, Daniel's off doing his business. He doesn't know what's going on. He's not even involved in it. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they say something like this. Hey, you know, we're not going to do that. Our God is going to come. You throw us in the fiery furnace, and that's what we're going to happen is you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace if you don't. I mean, their lives are on the line. They are, listen to what I'm saying, it's in their bones what they believe. There's beat them to death. They're not going to go away. They're not going to stop. And so they're not going to bow down. They fire up that fiery furnace, gets hotter than ever before. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego make this statement, and I love this statement. He says, but if not, first of all, if not is our God will rescue us. Thank you. Our God will rescue us. But if not... In other words, I don't care if he rescues me or not. I'm still me. I still got God. And I'm still going to do what I know to do. But if not, let it be known to you, O king. Wait a minute. They're talking to the king. This king breathes wrong on you. You're cutting pieces. He's so powerful. He doesn't have to account to anybody. You don't badmouth him. You don't talk back to him. You don't go against him. You're dead. But when something's in your bones, man, doesn't matter who you are facing. You just have to do what you have to do. And he makes this, O king, that we do not serve your God, nor will we worship the gold an image in which you have set up. Man, they're headed for the fiery furnace. Hey, grab those three guys. They throw them in the fiery furnace. The king walks up, looks inside the fiery furnace, and says, didn't we throw in three guys? It looks like four in there. And one looks like the son of God. Hello. They come out of the... They come, this is a true story. They came out of the fiery furnace. There wasn't even a smell of smoke on them. Let me tell you something. When you are resolute about who you are, about your God, about what you can do with your God, there will not even be a smoke on your life. But we need a church to be resolute. The church of the living God ought to be the toughest thing going. You can beat the snot out of me. I'm not giving up. I'm not backing down. I'm not looking the other way. I just want you to know I'm going to kick the crap out of you while I'm doing it. Come on, somebody. Now listen. I'm just talking like a 20-year-old right there. I can't even make a fist, but I will slap you good. So God's good, and he's looking for someone to be resolute. Second thing we need to understand, and I think it's important, is we need to resolve to be uh, 
uh, persevere, if you will, persevere to the end. Persevering to the end means I'm in this to the long haul. I'm not going to have pressure come against me and quit. I'm going to persevere. I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm not going to back off. Has anybody ever had thoughts come in your mind that tells you to do something different than what you should be doing and you know it? And you end up, well, you know, I won't go to church every week. I'll just go online. Now, I know we have a great online group of people, and I love you, and God bless you, but you need to be in church and stop that online stuff. You need to show God that you can get dressed, and you can get in your car, and you can drive, and you can be here where the anointing is fresh. It's easy. I want you to know something. We need to persevere to the end where the anointing is. Are you following me? We don't need to just go along patty cake. I'm, I'll do this. I love one guy who says, man, I've been faithful for a long time to the church. I said, how long have you been in the church? He said, six months. I said, oh, shut up, get out of here. <laughs> Guys, listen to me. We need to persevere, not just for a little while, but to the end. That's what God's looking for. Let me give you a scripture on that. It's kind of fun as we look at that word of God. Galatians, here's Paul writing that church again in the sixth chapter, verse number nine. Sixth chapter, verse number nine. But let us not, everybody say not, let us not grow weary while doing God. None good but God, so there it is. Right? Let us not grow weary by none good but God, so therefore, let us not, that's the translation of that word good right there for us that are believers. He says, let us not grow weary in that which is God. In due season you shall reap if, biggest little word in the Bible, if, more people are ruined by two letters, if, than anybody else. If you do not lose heart. Yeah. This is about, about having trouble and problems. You got to have a resolute that you're going to persevere all the way to the end. Yes, the problems are coming. Yes, they're going to, you have to deal with them. Yes, anybody that told you becoming a Christian, you're no longer, you're immune to any problems and God will jump in and rescue you. I want you to know something. God will jump in and he will rescue you, but he might let you get the snot knocked out of you so you can grow in the things of God and grow in the ways of the Lord. Is anybody listening to this at all? So powerful. In Acts, the 20th chapter, I love these words. In Acts, the 20th chapter, none of these things move me, Paul writes, because he's persecuted and pressure on him. They don't bother him at all. Nor do I count my life dear. See the words, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. One of the things, if you think so much of yourself, it's going to be hard for you to persevere to the end because there'll be pressures. Get off yourself and get on God. Let me say it again. Get off yourself and get on God. Get off yourself and get on God. Because when you're off yourself and you are on God, the, do the job is done. Come on, somebody. It's so true. The third thing I wanted to share with you that God gave me to share, which is really kind of cool, is that we need to be resolute to endure hardship. Very much like the second one, but this is enduring hardship. You will have hardships in your life. Don't ever go. You go to a church and they say there's no hardships. Guess what? You're going to feel really bad because you're going to have hardships. You're going to wonder why nobody else has it. They all have it. They're all, they're all have it. Let me ask you a question. Let me show you what I mean by that. How many of you, since you got saved, have hardship in your life? There are about half of you. The rest of you are liars, and we're going we're gonna to cast the devil out of you at the end of the church service. Are you know what I'm talking about? You know, and the Bible says liars don't go to heaven. You all need to get saved. There is nobody that hasn't had hardship. Debbie and I, building this church, had hardship. We had hardship in our marriage, hardship in our children. You know, all my children serve God. Do you think it was that way all the time? Are you kidding? I wanted to strangle them. God himself had to show up in my room and stop me from killing them. 
Hardship. We all have hardship. Hardship of finances. I mean, where, where's enough is enough? I mean, come on. It's unbelievable. I mean, when I took this job, I took a job as a pastor of the church. I was making a lot of money. God says to me, I said, God, they can't. I, I'm thinking about money. And I said, they can't afford me at the church. I started the church. I put a basket in the back. I never took up an offering. Did you know that? For three years, I didn't want the church to make it. Because I'd make it so much money in the business world, I didn't want the church to, to make it. Uh, why would I want to do that? Then God speaks to me one time. I'm driving this pickup truck going someplace in front to the church. And he says, I want you to go to work full time for the church. The church needs a pastor. And I said, God, they can't afford me. He says, yes, they can. I said, oh, really? <laughs> he says, you give them the money. I mean, I'm the only guy that uh, I'm the only guy that uh, anointed myself, ordained myself, and paid my own price to get a job. What kind of junk is that, God? But guess what? I, God spoke, and that's the way it was. And that's what we did. Hardships come to everybody. What are you going to do with them when they come? How are you going to deal with them? Did you know when pressures come on you, what comes out of you shows what's in you? I hate this part of the message. <laughs> if you squeeze toothpaste, tube of tooth, what comes out? Oh, thank you, front, front five rows. <laughs> well, the rest of you didn't brush your teeth today. <laughs> Let's try it again. If you squeeze toothpaste in a tube, what comes out? Toothpaste. And the back row didn't brush their teeth at all either. <laughs> when you squeeze toothpaste in a tube, what comes out? Toothpaste. That's better. When you squeeze a Christian with pressure, what comes out? <laughs> God only knows. The finger goes up. The words from high school come out. Oh, don't look at me like you're all religious like that, you know. Shh, come on. You know when you're squeezed under pressure, first thing you say is, God, what are we doing? What are we talking about? I went to church last month. I got a cross around my neck. I got a bumper sticker on my car. Now I got problems? That doesn't make sense. When you're squeezed, what comes out tells you where you're at. And Pastor Jim, not Dan, I don't think he's ever squeezed and anything came out but the real word and he's the real deal. But me, I'm like you. I'm more like you than you know I'm like you. And I ain't proud of it either. We all should get just resaved. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I just pressure. First thing I start belly aching. Does anybody do that besides me? Liars. <laughs> and you know, this is the way it is. You have to learn how to endure hardship. I like what it says in James. James, anybody know who James is, by the way, when you read the book of James? Ever stop to think about who he is? James is, listen to this. He's the half-brother of Jesus. Can you imagine being the half-brother of Jesus? I mean, if I was a half-brother of Jesus, I'd sell my 8-track tapes for $500. <laughs> Jesus, you know, he's the half-brother of Jesus, and he's the pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes this word. He said, blessed. Listen, look at what it says. Is the man who endures temptations, that's pressures. For when he has been approved, wins that when you win, he will receive the crown of life in which the Lord has promised to those who love him, who love him, who love him that keep his commandments. Man, that's a powerful verse. You can go on for two weeks just on that verse. It's just so deep. It's crazy, makes crazy. And so, my friends, we're going to have to learn how to endure. If you will, we're going to have to learn how to persevere, if you will. 
to the end and endure hardships. Number four, this is my favorite. Are you ready? A resolve or a resolute to practice what I believe. That's what I had to do. Because you can believe something and you can quote something and you can know something and still not do it. And in order to do it, you have to practice it. When I was a professional baseball player when I was young, I played for what you know as the Oakland Athletics as a pitcher. In my day, they weren't called the Oakland Athletics. They were called the Kansas City Athletics. One day, the owner of the company brought in to me a uniform to put on, and I was one of the first people ever to wear the gold and green, what you know to be the Oakland Athletics uniform. In those days, it was Kansas City Athletics. And I was a pitcher. I had played ball all my life. That was in me, baseball, not God, baseball. If you, I don't know how, but I know baseball. You go to a ball game with me and let me talk, I will talk baseball. I don't know about the players, I don't know anything. I just know that I can look at a batter and tell you what he's looking for, and if I could throw it in the right spot, he's going to be out. My problem was throwing it in the right spot. I also know the hitters, I know the people, not who's there and who isn't there, but how they stand. I could look at the outside of them and see how the game works. And I knew the game, but when I went to spring training, something happened that really bothered me. They would run through the fundamentals of things over and over and over. I would pretend like I was pitching on the mound. And then they would hit a ball to my left side. I would have to immediately run over, cover the first base, so that if the first baseman fielded the ball out there, I could catch it, and I was the first, become the first baseman on any ball hit to my left side. And the first time they did that, they yelled at me, Cobra, what are you doing? I said, Skipper, I know what to do. He says, I don't want you to know what to do. I want you to do it so it becomes part of you. Get in there, do what I tell you to do, or get home. I went, Yes, sir. They hit a ball, for an example, a man on third, they hit a ball up in the sky, and the ball goes in the sky. A pitcher automatically knows, without even thinking about it, he goes around and he gets behind the catcher, in first, uh, uh, behind the catcher. So when the ball is caught and the guy tags up and he heads home, they throw the ball, it doesn't go wild, but the pitcher is there. I knew that. I go to a game with Deborah. She doesn't know why they run the bases this way and not that way. Why don't they just run over there? That's an empty base over there. Oh my God, did you ever play baseball? No, I never was a jock. You don't have to be a jock. My goodness, you gotta know something. And she doesn't know anything. How many of you realize that in those days I knew what to do, knew how to do it, and could do it? You ask me today to do that? I don't think I'd catch the ball. I'd probably get a black eye trying to catch the ball. I certainly couldn't throw the ball. That isn't going to happen at all. And if I had to run to first base, I better hit the ball out. Listen, I could hit the ball out of the ballpark and be in the other side of the stadium, across the ballpark, guy run out of the field, go through the bleachers, across the ballpark, and throw the ball back into the, I'd still be running to first base. <laughs> Why? All because I know what to do, but I never practice it. What you don't practice, you will lose. It's as simple as that. That's why God says, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Practice this to your kids. Practice this to your kids. So watch this. So a couple of years ago, I'm retired, I'm getting sloppy, getting lazy. My, my mind is in a different place. I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated at everything Deborah does. She just can't please me. I'm complaining. I'm complaining to God. 
I'm talking to her. We're bickering back and forth. I, I used to be gone working all the time, preaching the message. You know, she'd be in church. I'd see her at night. We'd have everything great. Uh, I used to practice the Word of God because I had counseling four or five times a week. And when you do that, man, you know what the husband's supposed to do. You know what the wife is supposed to do. I'd go home and do what the wife and the husband's supposed to do. Deborah and I were taught solid, strong. And now here we were retired and we're starting to bicker in our marriage. And then I'd pray to God, God, you got to change this woman. <laughs> Don't ever do that. He starts by changing her, by changing you. If you're going to pray about someone else, it's you he's starting with. Are you listening to me? Wait a minute now. The story's not over with. And God speaks to me and says, you know what to do, but you're not practicing it. You got to practice this. You got to practice what a, how to love your wife as Christ loved the church. How to see her the way I would see her. I say, God, I, I'm in love with that woman. Man, I, I just chase her all over. And you know, I, I, Grandpa still chases Grandma. <laughs> Doesn't mean I do anything, but I'm chasing her. <laughs> I, I don't even know if she's out there to chase. And if I did catch her, I'm too sleepy. Life has changed. That's why I got a motor home. 100 square feet. How can I miss? <laughs> Too old. Nah, here's the deal. You got to practice what you don't practice in life, especially when it comes to the Word of God. You will lose, and eventually you won't fight any fight at all, but sit back and do nothing and be void of the blessings that God has for you. Today, four things, and I'm going to quit. Resolute two. Number one was go forward. Resolute two. Number two is to persevere to the end. Resolute three was that you're going to have to endure hardships. Listen, Resolute four, you're going to have to practice what you know and what you believe in. Has anybody heard from God today? Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! Isn't that good?